I'm joined by Dr. Timothy Hendricks. He's the Medical Director of Advent Health Centre Care. Dr. Hendricks, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, glad to help. So we have what is known as community spread here in Florida. What exactly does that mean? Well, that means in the weeks leading up to this point, we've been working diligently on confinement and preparation. So we've been isolating those few cases in the last few weeks to make sure that they're not transmitting. So now we're seeing more cases, not a whole lot, but more cases that may be person-to-person -person transmission here in the community. So our next phase of preparation is getting ready for more cases coming into our centric care, more sick people uh, coming into the hospital, and trying to manage the increase in patients coming into our hospital facilities. If people come into hospitals, if they come into urgent care facilities with symptoms, what can they expect to happen? So if somebody comes into a center care today and they've got sneeze and runny nose and itchy nose, they probably have allergies. So it could also be if they have a fever or cough that's consistent with this infection and they have risk factors, we can test them for coronavirus. Um, it would be a nasal swab, it's sent out to a lab, but it takes about three or four days to get those results back. It's not a um, fast turnaround time on these labs because as we've started doing testing, more and more people are getting tested, so the labs are kind of slowing down a bit, but we can do the test and determine if they are positive for coronavirus. That can help us to identify those people that have the infection and get them home and get them isolated and uh, keep them out of the public. The vast majority of people that are diagnosed with coronavirus are going to do fine and they'll be able to just home, uh, home isolation and self-care at home. But in the meantime, before those test results come back, mm -hmm. and like you say, that it can take a while given that more people are now doing it, uh, what do you advise that people do? Well, if I'm testing you, you're going home and you're not going to leave the house until we get the test results back. I can't force you to do that, of course, but we want you to be smart because if there's enough suspicion for me to test you, then there's enough reason for you to stay home and self-isolate until the results come back. Now, when the results come back, if they're negative, then we can um, allow you to go out. Um, you just have a cold, you have a virus. Common things are still very common right now. The flu, upper respiratory infections, et cetera. So the vast majority of cases are actually just the, the upper respiratory infections that we're seeing in the central Florida right now. And when you get a positive diagnosis, if you get a positive diagnosis for somebody, what are you required as a, as a medical provider to do with that information? Do you have to give that to the authorities? Yes, we have to report that to the state. That is a reportable disease right now. So um, any type of pandemic organism like coronavirus, we report that to the health department. The health department would follow up because it's very important that they identify these patients because we can track and identify where the outbreaks are in our community um, so we can direct resources that direction. Obviously, you guys are not the state, but I, I wonder if you are anticipating more tests arriving, that kind of thing. Are you in a position to, to say that, or do you have what you need now? We're pretty well stocked right now. Of course, uh, supplies are getting low, but we're getting resupplied through our lab. Um, Advent Health has a commercial lab that they implemented last week um, in their own lab. It's not the state test. Um, there are other private labs that we can also send testing to. Quest and LabCorp also have testing. So there are other resources to get testing done. So you're getting there at, the, at this point? Yes, yes. I don't anticipate uh, running out at this point. We hear a lot about hand washing, using hand sanitizer. Should people be doing this kind of thing all the time? Are there actual recommendations for how often people should be washing their hands? Uh, every time you think about it, use your hand sanitizer or wash your hands. If you have access to a, um, a sink and soap and water, that is your best resource, your best um, uh, treatment to, I mean, sorry. <coughs> yeah, yeah. The best thing you can do is wash your hands as frequently as possible, whenever you think about it. So if you have access to a, a sink and, and soap, go ahead and wash your hands. That's the best way to prevent coronavirus. Hand sanitizers are right up there with a good way to treat that. So if you have hand sanitizer, um, you're coming in contact with people. Um, if you're um, uh, at the store, wash your hands before you start shopping. Wash your hands when you're done. Uh, people have asked me about um, what about home deliveries or maybe the, uh, the guy that's delivering stuff, maybe he's sick. I'm like, look, any item that comes into your house, just wash your hands after you handle it. The federal government's asking people not to gather in groups of more than 10, but we keep seeing people getting together. We've seen large groups at the beach. We saw those thousands of people at Disney World, for example. What's your recommendation on, on whether people should be getting together in large groups at the moment? 
Now is the time for action. We need to take these recommendations seriously. Um, we have an opportunity to slow the spread in our community and there's a social responsibility of every individual to heed those warnings and those advice and that advice. So um, if you're planning a party, if you, you know, look, you just need to re-plan those things. We need to disrupt our lives. We need to plan on a major disruption to our lives for several weeks here so we can slow the spread. Um, I, I just don't think it's a, a wise idea to get together and, um, and there is that possibility of transmission in larger groups. Some people do have to go to their offices. We have to go to the office, mm -hmm. you have to go to the office, exactly. the police have to go to their office. There are various people that have to go to the office. What's your advice for people that do have to be around others at this time? Six feet, keep that six foot buffer around you. Um, we were just in the hallway uh, talking, uh, my, my leadership team, and we kind of like naturally just kind of spread out a little bit. And somebody said, hey, aren't we getting a little too close here? We're not shaking hands. We're not you know, touching each other. We're just keeping that distance, wiping down surfaces at work, uh, using the sanitizer to wipe down surfaces, doorknobs, uh, uh, keyboards, phones, that type of thing, and just being smart about your contact. Again, this virus, cannot jump from person to person if it's more than three to six feet away from you. This is not suspended in the air. So if you're in your cubicle and somebody's next door to you in their cubicle, there's gonna be no risk of transmission that direction. When you go visit with that person in a cubicle, lean on their keyboard or touch their desk and you touch your mouth or nose, that's how the transmission occurs. So we just have to be smart about that contact and wash your hands frequently while you're at work. It's very difficult to do, right, when it is a something that we do so often, it's reflexive, I've got it my nose itches, <laughs> I know. my eye itches, mm -hmm. and I got to touch it. That's incredibly hard to do, especially if you're talking about, say, children. Yeah, and um, and that's it. we just have to start altering those behaviors. If you're um, having concerns about that, getting a, a you know something you can a hand squeezy or something to op occupy your hands otherwise, but make sure you clean that hand squeezy um, or whatever that stress ball or whatever it is that you can redirect those behaviors. Um, you know there is a argument that using a mask uh, could help. You know wearing a surgical mask could help you prevent touching your mouth or nose because it, it reminds you of that. But our problem is is there's a mass shortage of those masks. There's no protection using that mask to the general public, and our healthcare providers are. Are, um, on short supply of those protective materials to protect them in 95 surgical masks etc so we want to make sure we divert all those resources to our healthcare providers that are on the front line dealing with this are those masks fully effective though uh, because there seems to be conflicting information about that people want masks but right. do they really protect you to the extent that you think they might No, because you have to know how to use them you have to know how to don and doff if you um, touch the mask and your hands are contaminated, you just touched your face um, when you try to remove the mask. If you, you have to wash your hands before you put on the mask, you have to wash your hands when you take it off. So there are specific procedures that is not gonna protect the general public unless they know how to use them, number one. But this is a droplet virus and we're getting more and more evidence that this is spread by those coughs and sneezes and the droplets go out and they quickly hit the ground and floor and surfaces around you. They're not sustained in the air around you. So walking down the street, um, with a mask on is not going to protect you. It gives you a false sense of security. We've seen a lot of people forego travel on planes and trains, for example, but what is your advice if people simply do have to travel, if people do have to get on public transit? Do you have any recommendations? Um, I, I would strongly advise against traveling at this time. Going from city to city, you don't know what city you're going into. Um, you don't know the situation. Um, you know, if you're on that plane, you're probably going to be one of a few people on the plane. So in terms of being on a crowded plane, I don't know there's a lot of crowded airplanes right now, but wiping down the, um, the armrest, wiping down the, uh, the tray table, you know, washing your hands, bringing hand sanitizers. So if you have to go travel, if you have a sick relative, you've got to go take care of them, uh, those types of issues. But we advise now's the time really to re- look at what your plans are. And I would say stay home, stay in your community. Um, don't risk travel at this point. I have Centra Cares in Kansas and we have Centra Cares in North Carolina. And uh, I, I'm just you know, doing a lot of phone calls right now instead of traveling to check on them. Here in Florida, we do have a large population of seniors and I'm wondering what your recommendations are for people who are worried about their elderly relatives. Should they be going to see them at the moment or, or should basically people be uh, leaving their elderly relatives alone until this virus subsides? That's a two-edged sword. Number one, we want to make sure that we keep those uh, elderly people isolated from the general population. So the risk is 
loneliness and isolation of those elderly people. They're at high risk of diseases of loneliness and isolation. So we want to make sure they're protected, but we also want to make sure we're in contact. So for example, you know, I called my parents this weekend. They're in their mid seventies. They have heart disease, other medical issues. And I'm like, I had a hard conversation with him because my dad is a, a stubborn guy, former firefighter. He knows, you know, he, nothing scares him, but he actually sounded scared on the phone. And that struck me because I've never heard that fear in his voice. And like, Dad, stay home. Well, you know, Tim, I got to, you know, deacon in the church, got to go take care of things. I'm like, you need to stay home. Other people can handle that. Um, my mom, you need to stay home. And you also need to keep people out of your house. No visitors, you know. The grandkids, you don't know what runny nose or whatever they got. You just need to avoid contact with them as much as possible for the next few weeks. Um, let's see how this thing goes. For at least three to four weeks, we'll see the progress. But avoiding contact, if anybody comes into your home, wash your hands and then um, stay at home. Now also, so my responsibility as a good son is to call them frequently, see how they're doing and giving them that social um, engagement that they need. Now there's plenty of other friends and family that'll be in contact with them, but if you've got a neighbor next door that's elderly, you know, check on them. Call or just talk through the screen door and say, how are you doing? Just checking on you. You know, if you need anything, just let us know. We need to support each other during this time. These are serious times and they're very disruptive to our lifestyle, but we're going to get through this, but we've got to do what um, our experts are recommending. Children are generally regarded as low risk, you know, those with strong immune systems that don't have underlying health conditions, for example, but they can still carry the virus. And I'm wondering how tricky it is for people to try to get their children to, to abide by good hygiene standards so that they don't carry the virus and give it to others. Right. That's the big question. And this, my wife and I were talking about this last night. Um, we were sitting there. I'm like, you know, the one thing is, is that um, I guess if there's any good thing out of this is that we have a very low infection rate, mortality rate with children, um, as we know from other countries. But those kids can still carry the virus and transmit it to other people. So we just have to be smart. Um, the closing of schools is a, um, is a big thing. I mean, I w I've been waiting for, all right, I don't like to disrupt the uh, kids' education, but I also want to be smart about it. And I think that closing the schools, because this is where transmission occurs. When we look at flu seasons, flu seasons usually start in schools and we see a, kind of a bump in kids and then we see moms and dads afterwards. So we got them um, just getting them out of mixing with each other. So play dates, you know, they need to cut back the play dates, cut back interactions with other kids, and also being very careful if they're um, sick to keep them home, teach them how to wipe their nose and uh, blow their nose and throw the tissues in the proper place and hand washing and hand sanitizers. What they see it, you doing at home, they're going to model that behavior um, when they're not with you. Florida's Director of Emergency Management put out a statement saying that if you test negative for coronavirus, that doesn't necessarily mean you're immune, just one of the bits of misinformation that's flying around. And I'm wondering whether misinformation, and in some instances, disinformation poses a problem to medical providers. I hear all kinds of rumors and they, uh, someone just blow me away, you know, that uh, hand sanitizers don't work. Yes, they do. So you have to be careful on the information you get on your social media feeds and the internet. Um, a reputable news source um, like yourself um, or your CDC or your own physician um, to make sure you contact them and say, look, I have a question about this. Um, we have a hotline at Centra Care at Advent Health, um, 1-877-VIRUS-HQ. Okay, we set that up to help get the right information out there. So if you have a question, if you have a medical question, if you have a clinical question, we can get you the resources you need um, so that you get the right information and you're not being misguided by and hearing things that raise a level of fear that are really undue. People who have elective procedures uh, currently scheduled, should they consider rescheduling them? And, and what are hospitals doing when it comes to, to elective procedures at the moment? Well, the reason that we're redirecting those elective procedures is just so our facilities are available for sick people. If you have an elective procedure, you might be in the hospital for a few days, um, and that'll take up hospital beds. So we are trying to free up beds and be ready for whatever comes at our way in terms of volumes. You'll see tents popping up in front of our hospitals. What are those tents for? We're not having a surge right now, but we're preparing, we're running drills, we're getting ready for those patients that come in. If we need to redirect people that are the walking well, they can go in and be seen in the tent as opposed to going into the hospital. So a lot of these behaviors are all about preparing for a surge of patients. So if you have an elective procedure coming up, I don't think it's gonna be your decision. The hospital is gonna tell you you're gonna to have to reschedule that.
Dr. Timothy Hendricks, Medical Director of Advent Health Centre Care. We know you're very busy. Thank you for spending a few minutes with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.